All right. Hello, everybody. We are live once again for day five of Arthritis Awareness Week. So if you haven't been with us yet during Arthritis Awareness Week, uh, what we're doing is trying to call attention to what we believe is the most serious health problem facing dogs because it is so widespread um, and not just as they get older. You'll see the title on the screen set says, wait, it can happen to young dogs too. Well, yes, it can. In fact, uh, my dog Hank was first diagnosed with his joint issues when he was less than one year old. And that mm -hmm. sort of started the roundabout path from me back in 2004, eventually getting into the, the dog bed world. So that's the topic of today's discussion, that this can actually happen to young dogs too. So we have two special guests with us. We have Dr. Hannah Capon, who you've seen with us the last four days as well. She is the founder of Canine Arthritis Management, and she devotes her entire life to helping dogs with arthritis. And we also have Dr. Karen Perry with us today, who is a small animal orthopedic surgeon at Michigan State University. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Hey guys, it's great to be back. And I am really, really pleased to be introducing a really dear friend of mine, Dr. Karen, who really is going to blow your marbles with how important this disease is, even in the young dogs. So let's start with the first question, Eric. How common is arthritis in the young dog, Karen? Please, the grim well, news. Yeah, this is, this is a huge topic for us. So, um, if, uh, if we look at some of the information and numbers that we have, um, then we know that we probably have arthritis in at least 20% of dogs that are over one year of age. So I know sometimes percentages don't translate very well. So if you think about that, it's one in five dogs. So quite a few people have five dogs, probably at least one of them um, has arthritis by the time it gets to over, be over 12 months of age. Um, and that's a pretty shocking statistic because we associate arthritis generally with those older patients. And I think it can be incredibly emotional and fairly distressing for owners to hear that their one-year-old dog that they still perceive to be a puppy, um, you know, has arthritis as a lifelong condition that we're going to be dealing with. Um, yeah. and I think that's probably a really hard conversation. And we said just before we went live that I find it probably the most challenging thing is to tell an owner who's got a brand new, shiny, not broken puppy and there's a problem yeah. and there's real, um, there's a pushback from owners because they don't want to hear it. And unfortunately, that's not going to help anybody. So what we hope today is that we're going to give you confidence that if you are seeing something, don't shy away from it because actually you shoot yourself in the foot. What you need to do is embrace it because it doesn't necessarily mean badness. Mm -hmm. You do need to know though. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And and I think, you know, it's, it's one thing when we've got an x-ray or something very obvious that shows the arthritis because you can show that to an owner and say look definitively this is what we're dealing with and I think having something in black and white you really just show someone okay I, I can't really deny this anymore but as we said that at least one in five dogs you know have, have this condition we know that x-rays don't pick this condition up until fairly late on in the process to be honest and even a CT scan can miss it if it's just affecting the cartilage in the joint for example so I think the really hard conversations are where you don't have anything definitive that you can show but you know that this is what the dog is dealing with and, and that long term this is going to be something you're going to need to manage and, and that starts really the moment you have that diagnosis that's when we start managing. Yeah, definitely. And again, I think I just want to add here from a very human point of view, no one's going to blame anyone. I've seen this quite a lot recently where there seems to be a need to apportion blame to the owner, to the breeder, to somebody that it's happened. That isn't the case. That just doesn't apply to this situation. So don't think that you're going to have your, you know, your knuckles wrapped because right. you've got <laughs> it's not something that you've done so don't shy away from it but you do need a professional to examine that dog cool let's go on to the next question because i think it's really relevant now what to look for and what to do if your dog could be predisposed to arthritis yeah and again this this can be a, a tricky topic because i think if again if we look back in, in kind of what we were talking about several years ago 40 30 40 years ago when we talk about arthritis we just associated arthritis with a limping dog and if the dog wasn't limping then we kind of mm, it probably doesn't have significant arthritis 
Um, and I think we're much, much better now at knowing that limping is just one of the signs that can come along with a dog that has arthritis. And actually, it's probably a fairly late sign as well. So lots and lots of other things that we can be looking at. And what can be really challenging is if this is your first dog or your first dog of a certain breed, because maybe you don't really know exactly what normal is for, for, that, for that dog, how active should that dog be um you know how far should they be able to walk and run with you from from various ages etc so it can be really tricky um, it can be just something like a dog that's being a bit of a couch potato rather than being very active because they're just choosing to avoid that activity um, and that's going to be true so if you have something like a newfoundland or a you know, a burning mountain dog or something, they pretend they tend to take a more laid back attitude and say, well, I'm just going to not exercise because exercising hurts a little bit. Um, however, take that to the extreme, you've got a young Labrador, their psychological urge is I'm going to exercise and I'm going to play and I'm going to do whatever I can do and probably beyond everything that I can do, even if it hurts and I'm going to pay for that later. So it may not be kind of an exercise intolerance or a reluctance to exercise it may be exercising like a crazy lunatic and running around looking completely normal and then just being a little stiff and still good the next day but then you get the ball out again and oh yeah they're gonna go again they're still gonna go so yeah. it, um, it can vary a lot of things it can be stiffness it can be lameness it can be just a dog being a little quiet it can be a dog shying away from human contact it can even come out as aggression or just uh, it's an altered demeanor of that dog that they're not behaving in the same way so low Loads and loads of different things that we can see, um, just posturing differently, sleeping in different positions, choosing to sleep somewhere else, maybe. Yeah. All these things can, can be a sign that something's not quite right. Um, yeah. And if you're concerned, it makes it really, really hard. Doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And it makes it really hard for owners because they always have that doubt in their mind. And I know that there are owners that don't want to go to the vet because they don't want to flag up something that's not there. And they're worried that they will go, you're wasting my time, right. which is a big concern of owners. We've, I've seen it for years. But there's also that fear that it could be a wasted expense if there isn't really something there. Absolutely. So, to have the confidence, it's better to get it checked and be wrong and there's nothing there. Then yeah. to actually get it checked, not get it checked, there was something and you've done nothing about it. Yeah, absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah, and for me, like my ears prick because I am obsessed. But if I hear somebody go, oh, he's, he's just Mr. Lazy, I'm like, mm -hmm. really? Dogs <laughs> don't do lazy. Why would they be lazy? They've got too yeah. much to live for. And if you've got grumpy, dogs aren't grumpy. They're no. not grumpy. They're mm -hmm. lovely. Dogs are amazing. They're better than people. So <laughs> a kind of a negative and you're thinking yeah it's a bit of a negative thing to say about a dog mm -hmm. oh, he's not he's not learning quickly he's another one oh he's really sick he doesn't learn quickly mm -hmm. you hear something like that that should flag up there could be something here so yeah. perfect like next yeah. question is there anything we can do to influence the disease in young dogs Whew. yes yeah huge amounts of things we can do and I guess that comes back to exactly what we just said that if you have any doubt any concern it is worth getting the dog checked out for sure um so to do a veterinarian um and have that initial assessment and this is really important particularly in younger dogs and I think sometimes that's kind of contrary to what you would expect maybe you think well it won't get really bad until the dog's older that's true the arthritis will get worse as time goes on but our best chance to intervene and slow down the rate at which it's going to progress and give this dog a really good quality of life despite its condition is early and we want to intervene super super early and and in young dogs that's particularly relevant because if they have arthritis at a young age that normally means they have a predisposing cause they have an underlying condition which has caused the dog to have arthritis and there are really good treatments available for a lot of those conditions um, and we were discussing just before we got online I think and I think Hannah had a, raised a really really good point is that it doesn't necessarily mean this is going to be a super expensive experience this doesn't mean that because you bring your dog in and I say, yes, you're right, he's not exercising normally. You're right, that swaying gait at the back isn't quite normal. It's not what we expect. And yes, we think your dog has hip dysplasia and associated osteoarthritis, even though we're only looking at a dog that's six or seven months of age. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be saying, right, okay, can you walk over 6,000 for us and we're going to go and do a hip replacement. That's that's not where we're going to go. Um, we're going to talk to you and say, if the worst comes to the worst and we can't control this disease in any other way, then hip replacement is our final option. It's our, our option right at the end of the line. But we have so many things leading up to that line 
that will hopefully keep the dog out of surgery long term if we do them right and if we institute them early. So all yeah. the things like keeping the dog at the appropriate weight, that's absolutely critical. Um, keeping the dog on appropriate floors and things at home. We might not have outstanding evidence for it, but it makes sense. If the dog's flipping around on lemon flooring all the time and flaring up its condition, it's going to make things worse. It's going to make it harder to, for the dog to control and, and remain pain free. So at home care is super, super important. Maybe changing diet. Maybe maybe the diet that your dog's got on is, is not, was great for the first six months, but maybe now it's time to change. Maybe now it's time to think about a diet that could keep the dog less inflammatory all the way through. We have some great joint specific diets available. Um, yeah. You know, all those kind of things. And yes, there's medication, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to medicate your dog for life. There's so many things before we get to that point. And yes, anti inflammatory yeah. therapy may end up playing a role. Additional analgesics may. Rehab is probably going to be critical. If we get this dog into rehab, definitely a better chance we keep them out of surgery long term. Yeah. So, all those things yeah. are relatively little and easy to do um, and it keeps the owner involved, it helps the animal pet bond, it does all those things and again hopefully we keep them out of surgery but we do have those great surgical options available if they're needed long term. Yeah I think the definite take home is don't be scared of it mm -hmm. is what I found with my owners is the earlier that we identify it and we get our routine in place and once you get this routine of what exercise is correct how you can make that exercise fun, interesting and beneficial. What can they eat? And how do we know that they're at the right weight? And how often do I need to just kind of have a quick check over? Sure. That's, once you've got that in place, you're free running. You know, you're OK. Yeah. And actually, I think it really helps you keep it like, as an owner. It's really helpful to actually have that diagnosis and also have that guidance from your veterinarian or the, or the nurse or whoever's helping you in terms of how to monitor your dog. These are the things to look for. These are the ways that you can monitor your dog. So even when you're seeing your dog every day, you will pick up if things are going downhill. You will pick up if you're needing to change something. And that means that you as an owner can have the confidence that you're not ignoring the fact that your dog is in discomfort or in pain, which... I think it's, it's we all have busy lives and we see our dogs every day it's easy to ignore that things are slowly slowly getting worse and having yeah. that very intervention will help that and, and avoid that from happening yeah definitely and i think i just wish i could put a slide that we use in one of our lectures up where um for a vet i know that i want to treat the young dog when i've got options and i've got a lot of choice and it's going to be low expense Absolutely. and i'm going to get good results but when i have the picture of the dog that's really debilitated I know that my options are fewer. I know that they're less effective and the results are not going to be as good. And it is yeah. that simple. So if there's one take home that you can get from today is don't be scared of seeing the vet. They're lovely like us too. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's going to be expensive and it's going to burden you for life. It probably is going to actually be the opposite. You're going to feel empowered, in control and able to manage it longer. Mm -hmm. So and this doesn't just apply to hips. We are talking about other joints, shoulders, elbows, stifles, hips. You know, all of the joints can be secondary to another cause. And the sooner you get that attended to, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so, Eric, do you want to pop back and start getting some questions going? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. So give me a second to get this banner off of here. We have a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, First, so Hannah, I think uh, Nicole agrees with you. <laughs> I think the dogs are better. Than so <laughs> the reason why we're vets, not doctors, right? <laughs> so Catherine has a question. Do you suggest a specific diet for osteoarthritis prevention? Um, there are there are a lot out there. So certainly we're not talking one specific brand here. And as I think as everyone knows, different dogs cope better with different diets. So be prepared to trial a few. Um, but certainly most of the ones that I would recommend for arthritis prevention are prescription diets. So you are going to need a veterinary prescription in order to get that in place. It's not super hardcore. Most of the companies, if you get one prescription, it's like a lifelong thing. You don't need to keep coming back over and over and over again for that. Um, and you don't always have to get it from a vet. You can still get it from online retailers and shop around for the best price but you do need a prescription um so the ones that i would be kind of the ones i use most commonly if you like are probably the ones from hills hills jd is a great one for me purina do another one which is called jm which works very well um and they're both essentially a very similar formula so they're 
chock full of omega-3 fatty acids and they actually do work to make the whole dog less inflammatory and therefore less painful. And they have been proven. They're one of the few interventions that isn't a drug which have been proven to make a difference. So yeah. if I was going to spend my money somewhere, diet is a big one for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for people that do kind of go, oh, my God, that's out of my price range. Don't feel that you're not going to do something by keeping your dog at the right weight. Right. So even if that's out of your reach and you are very stuck to the diet because of price reasons, then do your best to keep them at a body condition score of around about four out of nine to five out of nine. And I will again put into your um, resources a link to the WSAVA body condition score chart so you can learn to make sure that your dog's the right weight. That is so, so important over everything. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add in, there are a few concerns with the dry specific diets because they're so full of fish oil that they might predispose dogs to gaining weight. They have actually been shown that you can, they have light versions too. And um, they also have ones that are actually combined with weight loss diets um, as well as having the joint diet involved. So you can certainly manage your dog's weight at the same time as being on a joint specific diet. But they are certainly a little pricier than the average food out there. So, yeah. All right. Question from Judy. My dog lays like a frog on the floor. Is this okay? That's one of my favorite positions to see in pictures. Um, but is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's for me, it's very, it's, if your dog is always laying that way, then it's probably just, this is the way your dog lays. There's a certainly my dog often lays that way too. And I know because I'm a surgeon and I've have, <laughs> have gone and ruled these, all these things out that my dog does not have a hip problem. Um, so if your dog is always laying that way, then maybe it's actually okay. Um, if your dog suddenly starts lying in a different position, then that's normally because they're trying to take some pressure or weight off of their joints. And maybe that's something to be a little bit more concerned about. But um, having said that, it's always worth just going and taking a look at that. Very easy for, for the hips to be manipulated and just see, are they absolutely 100% normal? So if you have any doubts, just get it checked out. But probably nothing huge to worry about if the dog's always done that. Yeah, and take a photo with you. I think um, people really forget how powerful having an image is for the vet because we're trying to work out what you mean. Absolutely. So take a photo so that we can actually see what you're talking about. Right. Yeah, and that's always made a huge difference for me too is when, when Hank started limping and stuff, it's hard to get him to replicate it in the vet office. Yeah. But with cell phones nowadays, it's it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we have uh, – so Vicky Becker, first she starts, she says she actually has two big barker beds, one for her lab and one for her GSD. But she's also concerned about her lab puppy. Her legs are abnormally straight. Is that a possible precursor of hip dysplasia? So that was an interesting one. So we do often, we do often see dogs standing with their hocks a little bit more straight um, when they are trying to offload another joint. And they often actually come into us because owners think the hocks are the problem. And often that's compensatory. Um, however, in my experience, that's normally been because of the stifle. So they're actually kind of extending the hock because they don't want to flex and extend the stifle so much. And it can also be because they're throwing their weight boards onto their forelimbs, which is causing their back legs to look straighter. So it can be kind of a general hind limb problem. It, that could be a hip, it could be a stifle. Um, so certainly, again, definitely worth getting checked out if they're looking abnormally straight because it is a sign that they're shifting that weight forward. Um, so that's really something going on the back legs and it also means they're potentially overloading the front legs a little bit, which we wouldn't want them to do chronically either. So um, yeah, definitely worth getting them checked out. I hope it's nothing super major and I'm very doable with, but better early than later, as, as we mentioned um, earlier. 100%. Gary Smith says his boy has arthritis in back hips and front wrists. He's overweight with a breathing issue. How do I help him lose weight? He eats very little, no treats. These are tricky, right? <laughs> they are tricky, but prescription diets, I think people really do not see the the wealth that the benefit that they bring with them. And I've had so Many people tell me that they're never going to get any weight off their dog, and I put them onto, and I am going to flag it up because I love it. Metabolic Mobility by Hills. It's great. I have done so well with this again and again. It's not not anecdote. This this work. So don't just look at you know how much you're feeding. Look at what you're feeding because mm -hmm. be a better diet for you out there. Right. 
And I think rehab can play a critical role in getting weight off these patients too. So obviously because your dog's dealing with arthritis, doing a lot of exercise and activity, and particularly with the breathing issue, that's going to be a little a little scary. We don't want to do too much high impact activity. But um, in a licensed rehab facility, if you go there, they can certainly do a lot with just water treadmill therapy, which can be slow, it can be, but it really makes them work quite hard. And that way they can very easily monitor the breathing while he's in the treadmill and stop the treadmill if we're ever getting a little overheated or something. So a lot more controllable than just being in a pool, um, but still can be great doing some obstacle courses, doing Doing some rehab in that way that's that's for me in conjunction with the diet that's the way to get the weight off quickest yeah and I I just I will say a little anecdotal story I had a client that had a dog that had laryngeal paralysis and arthritis and they they felt that they were hitting a brick wall they really didn't know where to go and they felt that this condition was making this worse and this condition was making this worse and they just were like going to give up and they actually went no we're not we're going to do the laryngeal surgery and then we're going to approach the arthritis. The dog did brilliantly. He did absolutely amazingly for another two years. So, you know, talk to your vet and say, I know I've got two conditions, yeah. but what can I do, you know? And I, I just think you have to have a really good communication with your vet. And I'm going to say it, if you're not having good communication with your vet, then seek a second opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. The next one, this is going to be a long one. It's what's going to cover some faces. So get ready. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <can't see> <laughs> So Diana says, I have a 19 year old, uh, not 19 month old pup from the British Virgin Islands who has severe hip dysplasia. We've tried laser therapy and underwater treadmill and she has built a tiny bit of muscle, but she continues to scream in pain when my other dogs play with her and then she limps for hours after. She also cannot poop without lifting her leg up. Uh, the vet supervising her PT says she now believes she needs surgery. Advice on total hip versus the FHO. Mm -hmm. She wants so much to be active and I don't want to, then it kind of ends here. Um, okay. So if you can, when you answer that, if you can explain what FHO yeah. is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, to kind of this is exactly what we're talking about when we're reaching the road where we've done all the things we think we can do medically and we've made all those lifestyle changes and we've still got dogs that are in pain, we do have some great surgical options available. Um, so if we imagine the hip joint, kind of this is your acetabulum in your pelvis, so the cup that the kind of top of the femur sits in and then we've got a head of the femur that sits in here, this is your hip joint here. Um, and the difference between what's called an FHO, which is a femoral head ostectomy, or sometimes also known as a femoral head and neck excision, they are the same thing, um, is that an total hip replacement is a hip replacement retains that normal anatomy. So you still have a cup and you still have a femoral head, but they're plastic on metal. So that's going to be your hip replacement, very similar to what we in people. FHO, on the other hand, says actually we're going to get rid of this normal anatomy and we're actually just going to cut the head of the femur off entirely. So you end up with your acetabulum, so here the cup ends up remodeling into a pretty much of a flat shape. You cut a flat edge on the edge of your hip here and you have a joint that works flat on flat rather than the ball and socket that you had previously. So that's the kind of two different procedures. Um, as you can appreciate, you have a total hip replacement. It maintains normal anatomy. It maintains the normal motion of the hip. So the dog will be able to flex, extend, move the hip in its absolutely normal way. And that will be pain free. Um, following an FHO, in contrast, you can imagine this joint doesn't work the same way. So the range of motion is absolutely anticipated to be a little bit more limited. Um, if someone drags, grabs that dog's hip and pulls it all the way back, it will still be painful because that joint's not meant to do that anymore. But the range of motion the dog has will be pain free. Um, and certainly it, it's still a great procedure. So why people choose one over the other, um, I'm going to be honest, a lot of the time cost comes into this. It, there's a big difference between the two. Um, a hip replacement in our hands, obviously I'm in the US, so we're talking about $6,000 um, and for a hip replacement, versus something more like about 2,500 to 3,000 for the FHO. So it's about half the price. Um, the other thing that scares people a little with hip replacements, anyone who's had a, a human friend who's had one of these done, there can be complications. So normally they're very, very effective. They work super well. And if your dog's one of those, then you're going to be super happy. The dog will bounce back and be great. Um, but if they get infected, if they um if the dog isn't rested very strictly postoperatively then we can get into some really quite nasty complications that do require more surgery and more expense so you have to be able to rest that dog very very well for about 12 weeks and if you can't it's not the procedure to do at all and i certainly wouldn't go into it just with six thousand in the bank 
Yeah. Because if you do that and then you do need to have something else done, then you're going to end up with a very, very expensive FHO at the end. Um, so doctors work beautifully with both. It's just being aware with an FHO that they will have a slightly altered gait on that side. You'll be able to see a limp, especially if it's a large approved dog, but it sounds like this is. So um, large approved dog, you will see a limp. It won't have a normal range of motion, but it will be pain-free doing day-to-day -day activities and it will function well, probably. Um, the only downside of an FHO is you're more likely to have to do both hips at some point. If you do a hip replacement, you're less likely to have to do both. So that's kind of some of the pros and cons without wanting to go on too long <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing isn't she she's blown you away <laughs> right, we have a, another another bigger one so so hannah get be prepared to get hidden again <laughs> okay cat higgins says good morning able to manage to get to this one i'm one of those owners one and a half year old golden doodle that weighs around 100 pounds that has double hip dysplasia what can i do to help him when he's having a restless night he will pace back and forth when he does lay down he goes uh shift from one side to the other can never find a good spot his left hurts more than the right. Could arthritis be setting in or just his hips being out? He used to love, or, love to run around and be crazy, and now he's just as sad, and then it kind of uh, cuts off there. Oh, that's sad. Um, I think this, this highlights one of those really common misconceptions when we have hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, um, cruciate disease, any of those conditions. The arthritis is actually there right from the beginning. From the moment we diagnose this dog, the arthritis is already there. Whether we can see it on x-rays or not, they can't have that condition and not have arthritis. So it's been there and it probably is progressing. Um, in terms of the hips being in and out, with the dog being now, I think it was one and a half. I think that's what that's what was said. Um, we're probably not feeling so much with hip popping in and out anymore. That instability tends to get less and less as they get to more about the age of two. The hips are not really popping in and out anymore because they've formed a lot of scar tissue around the joint. So I would anticipate that a big proportion of the pain we're dealing with now is going to be arthritic pain as opposed to instability pain. But there may still be a little of instability associated. Um, so in terms of that, um, keeping dogs comfortable, lots of things we can do. Obviously, weight loss, rehab, all those kind of things, as we've mentioned before. It sounds like you're doing the laser therapy, all those kind of things. It may be time to start thinking about um, introducing some anti-inflammatory therapy and see if that helps. Um, so that would probably be my next thing. And then we can give that maybe with dinner so that it's having like peak activity at night if that's when um, it seems to be most uncomfortable. Um, non steroidal anti-inflammatories are actually very, very well tolerated in the vast majority of dogs. So if that was my dog I, and that discomfort was that evident, that's kind of where I would be going, as well as looking at all those at-home things we talked about before, making sure we're not on slippery floors, making sure we've got nice, comfortable beds, all those kind of things. Yeah, and I think uh, to add to that is something that I deal with a lot with owners is that they think that that intervention is now for life. And I think that's what puts people off going there. It doesn't need to be. Because what it does, it buys you a window of opportunity to put other changes in place. So by having the dog not uncomfortable and not in pain, they're going to start using their hips again. They're going to start rebuilding the muscle and the function. That's going to stabilize the hips further, and we're going to need less anti-inflammatory. Yeah. But um, you need to step into that zone. You're going to be looking at an anti-inflammatory for a period of time. Something else that really upsets me is when these drugs, which are incredible what we can do now, aren't given a chance you know you're going to have to accept you're going to be on it for a while and when you put all the homework in then hopefully you'll be able to come off of it thereafter or lower the dose or use it transiently intermittently but um don't be shy of going to your vet my my ears are pricking my little light bulbs are going off that you really need to see the vet for that one yeah right and also i mean this is a prime candidate for a big barker bed i mean if you don't cat if you don't have one already i mean definitely look at one and if you haven't seen the clinical study is for dogs like this. I mean, uh, the clinical study at University of Pennsylvania took dogs that were 70 pounds or bigger that had diagnosed case of arthritis and gave them a bed, big barker bed for four weeks. And um, yeah, we'll put a link to the the study uh, if you're signed up for the event at like bigbarker.com slash AAW. But basically, after four weeks, the dogs had less joint pain, restored joint function, better mobility, and lots of other things as well. We can send you the report later. Um, but yeah, definitely look at one if you don't have one already. Mm -hmm. So I have a comment here from Catherine. Says her grand dog had an FHO and well done. Good, good efforts. Nice. Good efforts. Yeah. That's brilliant that you put that up there because it gives people confidence. And I think people are really scared of the unknown. And it's their best and they're doing something really invasive and they're terrified that it might be the bad choice. So well done, Catherine. Thanks for putting that up there. And then the last one, this isn't a question. This is a 
This is a comment from, from Jennifer Jackson, which I think does a great job of summing up why we all put so much effort into fighting against arthritis. It's just the sentiment um, here. Uh, so when we had Rascal Jr. and it got to the point where he couldn't walk around the block because of his arthritis, we still made him feel that he did real good. We would put his leash on and I would walk him to the street and I knew he couldn't go no further, but I said, look at you, you did it. So proud of you, and I know that made him feel good. Any of us that have been in that experience, that probably uh, moistens our eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a good place to wrap up, not just today's presentation, but Arthritis Week. So I want to thank both of you, uh, and 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 Hannah, thanks for being with us all five days. Uh, I think we have Pleasure. tremendous presentations. So. Everybody watching, go to bigbarker.com slash AAW. We'll put a link with this video. And if you go there, we will email you not just this presentation, but the other four presentations, plus a ton of resources we've talked about this week, plus the clinical study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so go ahead and do that, bigbarker.com slash AAW. Thank you both. Thank you, everybody. No and have a great week. See you later. Bye. Bye.